I'm going to speak on regional distribution. And I had the favor of um, getting hold of an EIT machine, the first one that Drager had required, <coughs> got hold of from Göttingen in 2001, I think. Uh, so it's 14 years back, and the first uh, device we got was um, what we shortly call user hostile. And that meant that we never managed to measure anything with it because it was too complicated. And after half a year, we got another one which we could measure patients with. And so what I'm going to tell you is a compilation of what we understand of gas distribution mainly based on what we have seen during our EIT studies. And um, so, so the, we are trying to move from, from the general picture, how much volume into the patient, and now we are going to see where does it go and what is the reason for its redistribution. And it's a lot about the belly. It's almost all about the belly. In a healthy land, the compliance of the alveoli are almost equal anywhere in the lung. So whether they are ventral or dorsal or lateral on the left or right, each alveoli has about the same compliance. And the total compliance is the sum of all al the compliances of all alveoli. So if you have a rat lung, it has a very low compliance, but it's perfectly normal for a rat. And if you have an elephant's lung, it, it's the sum of the compliance of all the alveoli in an elephant is much bigger. Uh, looking at a, pay, uh, a human being, it, we would call him emphysematic, very, very high compliance. And in, in the lung, when, what I'm going to speak of is mainly patients lying supine, being mechanically ventilated. But in this healthy patient, let, let's say in the OR, the patient is still having a somewhat better compliance at the ventral part than at the lower part. It's about the superimposed pressure, the pressure in the tissue is about three centimeters of water higher at the most dorsal part than in the upper part. This means that the alveoli in the top of the lung will be a little bit more inflated than those at the bottom. And uh, when we look at the... So there is a reason for a somewhat different uh, uh, regional distribution. But then we could regard the lung the whole lung as a number of alveoli forming an upper, a, 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 a ventral, a mid-ventral, a mid-dorsal and a dorsal lung. Four parallel vertically stacked uh, uh, lungs. The ventral, the volume of the ventral lung is about 20% of the total. The mid-ventral 40, the mid-dorsal a little less 30. And the dorsal is only 10 because the spine is coming in and so on. So the compliance of this part of the lung is 20% of the total compliance and 40, 30 and 10. So, of course, when we look at this uh, uh, ordinary PV curve, when we do a slow inflation, it looks like this. We have a lower inflection point and then it's, we get on the steep curve and we have an upper inflection point and people think that this is the first part here is significant in the way that when we are reaching the lower inflection point they say that the lung is now recruited it's getting better but this is impossible this is absolutely wrong because just think of you you are having four balloons with different compliance connected to a mouthpiece and you start blowing. How, which of these lungs, if this was a balloon, this one, one, so, and you blow and they are 
or receiving gas. Which land will receive gas first? This one. Because, of course, gas will move towards where the compliance is highest, it's easiest. So the, the idea that this shows that gas would go into the most difficult part of the land first, and when it's penetrated that part of the land, it will go to the easy. It's unnatural science. It's not natural science. It's impossible. So this is just telling that when you inflate the land, you inflate it from top to bottom. So this shows the 20% compliance. Let's look at it like this. This is the ventral 20%, the volume in the 40%, 30, 10, and compliance is related to the size, proportional to the size of the lamb, like in the rat and in the elephant. And this is the elephant and this is the rat in this case. So the curve is just showing that we are inflating from ventral and down and this is the compliance of the ventral lung, compliance of the mid-ventral, mid-dorsal, and the dorsal lung. So the compliance is showing where the lung has the largest volume. So if you have a very low compliance, total compliance, then the lung is very small. It's related to the size of the lung. So, whatever position you have, if the lung is isolated, there's very little difference in compliance. So if you enter gas or you change the position, gas will go everywhere, almost everywhere, be distributed evenly in the lung. Very small differences. But then we have changes. Lung in the pulmonary ARDS, like pneumonia, then you have a very wet lung. The weight of a lung with ARDS is about three kilos, two to three kilos. And the FRC, the lung volume at end expiration with seropene, may be down to only 500 milliliters instead of 2,500 milliliters. So it is a baby lung, but it is a pulmonary baby lung. That means that the rest of the lung volume is fluid. It's like you have a balloon which is filled two-thirds with water. And you can imagine that if you increase PEEP, you, get not, you cannot get rid of that uh, fluid. You can only overinflate that top part of the lung. And it's a baby lung because it's only a baby lung that is open. But if we look at the extrapulmonary ARDS, the respiratory failure because of influence of the belly, then it's a high abdominal pressure, a lot of edema in, in the uh, uh, abdominal cavity, a high weight, and that means this high weight will push on the diaphragm and lower the lung volume. So it's a baby lung by being pushed, squeezed, the gas is squeezed out by the uh, uh, amount of uh, edema in the abdomen. And of course, if you do anything in this, the lung is fairly okay. So if you increase PEEP, you inflate the lung and you push away the diaphragm. And open the thoracic cavity for the lung to work on its own uh, merits. So it's, the, the lung is here fairly, often it's also, of course, uh, uh, it has been hit by the disease, but it's much better than in the, um, in the uh, pulmonary. So the extra pulmonary patient is a patient where PEEP will do good within certain levels, 
and in the pulmonary it is a situation where you risk to overstretch or at least inflate the lung a lot, getting up to very harmful pressures, tearing with each tidal volume mm -hmm. in the lung tissue. And then remember that all of us, even if when we are healthy, we are extra pulmonary because we have the weight, the basic weight of the lung, of the abdomen, which is forcing the abdomen, uh, the diaphragm up, and I will show more of this. So when we are discussing uh, lung injury, ventilator-induced lung injury, I think it's unfair to the manufacturers of, of ventilators because it's really doctors-induced lung injury because these doctors and nurses who are turning the knobs into a position where they should not be. But anyhow, airway pressure is the pressure that inflates the lung, overcomes the, the elasticity of the uh, lung and pushes away the abdomen. And the pleural pressure or esophageal pressure is the pressure that is needed to push away the, the abdomen and the, the chest wall. And the lung pressure, the pressure that really hits the lung is the airway minus the pleural pressure. And in the extrapulmonary patients, the pleural pressure is high, so the transpulmonary pressure, the pressure that hits the lung, is fairly low. And if PEEP is high, there's a low risk for lung injury caused by the bad setting of the ventilator. But in the pulmonary, the esophageal pressure or pleural pressure is very low, so the transpulmonary pressure, the pressure that is pushing the lung is very high and high PEEP means a considerable risk of, of uh, lung injury uh, by, by bad settings. So uh, some months ago I had the opportunity to write an article together with uh, Gattinoni and Jeran Hedenstern in Uppsala uh, reintroducing the fact that the rib cage has an enormous role to play in how gas is distributed. Because you know at FRC, when, when we are in the situation we are now, there is a balance between, at end expiration, there is a balance between the rib cage striving outwards and the lung trying to recoil. So that's why we have the negative pleural pressure. And the negative pleural pressure equals it's what keeps the lung open at FRC. So if we didn't have the rib cage trying to hold up the lung, we would collapse. So, and any one of you who have done um, cardiac resuscitation, you know, pushing down the on the heart, you know that the chest wall is coming up immediately unless it's uh, 85 years where you start with cracking the ribs. But otherwise, it, it's, it's very elastic and comes out immediately. And this is very important because at end expiration, even when we increase PEEP, the, line, the chest wall, the rib cage is trying to get move outwards and it, it moves outwards even with high PEEP and the lung is offloaded from the chest wall. So the, at end expiration, even with a high PEEP, increased lung volume, the rib cage tries to move out, keep the lung open. But of course if you have a huge part which is filled with fluid, this part cannot be, the rib cage cannot suck this fluid away. So it's only in the area above the fluid that there is a negative pleural pressure. At the bottom, at the ventral, uh, dorsal part of the lung, the lung is actually lying on the thoracic, back of the thoracic cavity. And there is this fluid 
cannot be recruited. There might be a small transitional zone where some alveoli can be open during tidal ventilation. But it's mainly what is usually called recruitment is more or less inflation of the lung. Oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong direction. Now let's speak about Willem Tell. You know, an arrow, uh, 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 an arrow, a string, and a bow. And the, let's think of this in the following situation. The string is, is a, not an elastic thing. You put it on the ends of the bow and bends it. So the bow wants to stretch the, the string. If, the, if we are trying to pull, then we pull the bow in. And the more we pull, the more the bow will want to go out. And if we are doing the other direction, the same thing happens. And this is the analogy of what is happening with the rib cage and the diaphragm. Now, if we start here, we have an empty thoracic cavity. We have nothing in the abdomen. We have the rib cage and the diaphragm. The rib cage wants to go out, so it stretches and keeps the diaphragm flat. If we insert the lung, and it will stick to the thoracic cavity by cohesive forces. The recoil of the lung will pull the diaphragm in, in an even uh, curl, and it will lower the ventral part of the thoracic cage. This is the same, and then we fill the abdomen and then you can see that instead of a nice even curve, we would get this. And we will get a further down step of the ventral rib cage. So now we have lowered the lung volume by the weight of the abdominal cavity. So lung volume is lower and it's mostly lowered here. So it's this is the fundamental thing about redistribution. Oh, sorry. Now, if you look here, we have an abdomen. The abdomen has a, a volume about 10 liters, so about 10 kilos in a normal 70, 80 uh, kilo person. And when we inflate, you can see it's going up and down because the, the rib, ribs are moving in like this. So the whole lung is affected in ventral, in, in caudal cephalid direction. So it's moving, this is moving parallel up and down. So when we are increasing the pressure here, we are not just causing an atelectasis here, we are causing a decrease in the lowest lung part all over the way. Up, up to the to the upper levels. So, sorry, I'll just show you again. This is up, down, up, down. So it's moving very nicely up and down the the front of the chest. It's not moving like this. It's moving like this. So if you fill, if you insert a ten kilo of edema here it will press it down, but it will affect the whole line from cranial to diaphragma. Now, what is usually called a, a recruiter is a patient that is answering to an increase in PEEP and increasing, with increasing compliance. So it's, it sounds like we have opened some part of the line and this has led to an increase in compliance, we call this a uh, uh, recruiter. But, but this has nothing to do with recruitment. This, this is just better inflation. So you can see here that the curves are parallel up. The, the, the 
the, here we have a lower inflection point and then it's a steep part and PEEP is giving more volume to the patient and more volume means more compliance. And this is the way, if we have a healthy extrapulmonary case, we get the edema, we, we uh, uh, and we put PEEP on, sorry, we have, uh, and we put PEEP on, we lower, we, we uh, uh, lift the ventral part of the line and we inflate these alveoli. And we get a very nice, as we are now inflating the lung so that more of the gas is entering the mid of the lung, the compliance is going from 40 to 55. This is very, very exaggerated. Uh, it's just to show you what's happening. In the, if we take the extra pulmonary lung healthy patient with the green alveoli and we put peritonitis with edema, then there will be a lower end expiratory lung volume. The alveoli will be less, smaller. There will be a the end expiratory lung volume has been decreased a lot, but there's nothing wrong with the lung, or very little long, uh, wrong with the lung. So if we inflate this lung by increasing PEEP, we will make it move. We will inflate it and push away the heavy abdomen, so the lung can expand on its own uh, merits. So. In this case, of the pressure you have in the ventilator, about 60% is for inflating the lung, but as much as 40% is for pushing away the very heavy abdomen. And of course, collapse is a dorsal phenomenon and you need very high pressures to open up a collapsed alveolar, 30 centimeters or more. And I think everybody knows that it's, there's a, some kind of consensus that we should not have plateau pressures over 30 centimeters. So this says that we normally don't have much recruitment during ventilation of our patients because we are avoiding these very high pressures. It's what we are doing is inflating the lung more because inflation of the lung is going, as I said before, from top to bottom. So when we do a slow inflation, this is the ventral and this is the dorsal. You can see that the first part inflation starts here mm -hmm. and the ventral gas is to 100% going in the upper part of the lung and nothing in the lower. And then it's successively coming also down. As pressure increases and the top, top of the lung is filled, <coughs> gas is going to the lower parts of the lung. And, he, and if, sorry, yes. And here is, uh, did I miss some? No? Okay. And this is another one doing with EIT, the same. This is, a, this is the EIT signal from the ventral lung, from the mid lung, and from the dorsal lung. And you can see that gas is first entering upstairs where there is no collapsed tissue. Tissue is downstairs, but gas is going at the top first, and then in the mid, and then in the dorsal lung. And before it goes to the dorsal, you must feel the top of the lung. And this can be seen on EIT. You can actually, I think uh, Eckhart will show this later, that you can see how much the delay is when inflation is going from the top to the bottom. And the more it's delayed, the more positive effects you will have of uh, PEEP. But also PEEP inflation, when you increase PEEP, it's the same. It starts from the top of the lung. So if you increase PEEP from five to eight, then you start feeling from the top and 
if you go further, then you st uh, fill the next part and it goes down. And it's important to understand that when you do a PEEP inflation, it's, it increases the end expiratory lung volume, but it, the end expiratory lung volume is also the pre-inspiratory lung volume. So this means that when you increase PEEP, you inflate the lung at top, and then the tidal volume will start at a lower level in the lung and going downwards, where circulation, lung circulation is better. So you improve the, the uh, uh, gas exchange. So if we start here with end, expiratory, uh, end expiration at seep, we do an inflation, we lift up the ventral part of the lung, and gas is going in here. Expiration, back to the same situation. Now we do a PEEP increase that results in a change in lung volume, end expiratory lung volume, as much as this tidal volume. So now we have inflated the lung to this level with the PEEP, and that means when we add a tidal volume, this starts at this level and goes further down. So PEEP is a way of moving the tidal volume, forcing the tidal volume down into the lung where there is better uh, circulation and gas exchange is improving. And this can be readily seen here in this um, EIT image. This is the EIT image at 5 of PEEP and I have inserted a, a rosa, a, a magenta line here for the top level of the most ventral uh, part of the lung and uh, this light blue is showing the dorsal level of the lung and now we are increasing stepwise 5, 10, 15 and have a look what's happening. So by increasing PEEP you are, it's not recruitment, it's moving the tidal volume down the lung where it reaches more well circulated parts and gas exchange is improved. And as it's not a question of, so here is the ventral, mid-ventral, mid-dorsal and dorsal EIT signal. This is 9% of the tidal volume goes into the dorsal, 19 into the mid-dorsal, 46 in the mid-ventral and 25 at the most ventral part. And when we increase PEEP from 6 to 16 here, after 20 minutes, the ventral gas has, the tidal volume has decreased to 15%. And the mid-ventral has gone down from 46 to 39. And you can see that the mid-dorsal has almost doubled. And there is also a 50% increase in the most dorsal part. So PEEP is a way of moving the tidal volume downstairs in the lung. It's the lazy doctor's prone position. It's a way of, of matching ventilation and circulation in the lung. And this is the way it looks, the regional distribution of end expiratory gas goes to the red and the yellow, which is the upper part of the lung, and you can see here that's it's 74% of the end expiratory lung volume increase goes to the top, and then the rest goes downstairs. So when you do a peep, a, a peep increase, you inflate the top of the lung, and by that you move the tidal volume downstairs. But as PEEP is an inflation process, if you decrease PEEP, like we have done here, 16, 14, 12, 10, 8, 6, everything returns to its pre-increase situation. You can see it's almost the same data over there. And what's also interesting is that 
how long time volume is increasing after increasing peak. So here we have a patient where we are looking at uh, how the, the changes lung volume is uh, uh, in expiratory lung volume in a in a responder in a non-responder, and you can see that well, it almost looks very similar. But when we look at the compliance, this is compliance: the uh, the magenta line and the the blue line is the top of the of the lung and the other two are the lower part. And you can see that compliance is increasing, not at the lower parts of the lung, but in the upper parts. It's the increase in compliance when you increase PEEP is not caused by recruitment, opening of collapsed alveoli in, in the lower part. It is the, that the inflation is going into the May mean uh, middle part of the lung where comply where volume is largest and compliance is largest. So it's a result of in further inflation of already inflated uh, lung. And you, you've all, all of you, uh, certainly read a lot about lower and upper inflation. Five? Are we five minutes left? Sorry. Uh, you have all uh, read about lower and upper inflection points, and this this is a very um, debatable uh, nomenclature because the lower, as I said before, the lower inflection points has been said to be a point where recruitment is finished, and then it's a, a better, a steeper curve, and then it's a over distension here. But the lip is really happening at the start of inflation and start of inflation is at the top of the lung. So it would be better to, to show it like this. The curve goes from here, this is the non-dependent, the ventral lung going down to the most dorsal lung and the curve should look like this because this is the way it's inflated. So the lower inflection point is topographically the upper inflection point and the upper inflection point is downstairs in the lowest part of the lung. And there has been written a lot of things about the lower inflection point because it's so easy to believe that lower means low in the lung but it means up in the lung. <coughs> I think we take a, the break now then. I think it fits very well. Are there any questions? Yeah. I, I will carry on. <laughs> you will not get away that easy. <laughs> uh, so I, I have about half left. Any questions on this part? Uh, just, does your discussion apply more to the... Uh, your discussion apply more to the extra extra pulmonary setting or yes I, next next hour we'll take the non responders the pulmonary what, how they behave and what is happening when you increase peak because this is so important that we very early find this the difference so we know whether they will favor from a high peak or not and do remember that I think this is, should be, you should know this immediately, as Nader said, you should really start doing the right thing immediately. When we are doing sepsis research, we are speaking about the golden hour, we want to do everything right, antibiotics, resuscitation, everything within an hour, and then we are happy and hopefully the patient is better. But in research on ARDS and PEEP and whatever, the patients are, let's say we want to study whether high PEEP is better than low PEEP, then the patients are included up to 72 hours after they were on the ventilator. This would be like applying for ethical approval of a sepsis study where you said 
we intend to try to see if antibiotics is good and we will give it when they have reached 39 degrees. Of course, this would not be allowed. I think our studies are really unethical because we should do the right thing from the beginning and that means as soon as they are on the ventilator, they should be found out whether they need or favored by a high or low PEEP, not after 72 hours. Really, I would say this is a very foul uh, 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 thing I'm going to say. I think quite in quite a few centres they want to include a lot of patients so they maltreat the patient for 48 hours so they are, can be included instead of treating them all right from the beginning. This is really bad. So one hour after the, they are on the ventilator, they should be found out how they should be treated, not after seven days. And you should not, as we have, we, we looked, made a survey in Gothenburg and found out, this was in the uh, 95 about, and we found out that the normal peep setting at that time was six centimeters. And uh, five years later, it had gone up. So we had reached eight, and and uh, was the normal set. And I think now that they have a um, um, default value, they are putting PEEP from the start to eight, and that means that possibly they are up at the average of ten now. So they will within five years be quite all right. There's only one problem: they do it on all. It's like. Uh, when we, everybody was happy about uh, insulin to all patients in the ICU, whether they need it or not, it's the same. If you put 10 in PEEP to everybody, that might not be all right. But as two-thirds of the patients are in favor, is, are extra-pulmonary, at least the majority, so it's a democratic decision, the majority will get a correct PEEP, but the minority will not. So in the future, I would like to see the correct people from within one hour.